And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello, everyone. I'm Ray Shasho, broadcasting from BBS Radio 1, and welcome to the show where we spotlight legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or visit www.publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. I am the luckiest guitar player on earth, Ed King declares. King caught <laughs> lightning in a bottle twice, first as co-founder of the hit-making Strawberry Alarm Clock, and then as a member of Southern Rock Giants Leonard Skinner. As a teenager, King was a founding member of the Sixpence, the high school group that transformed itself into the Strawberry Alarm Clock. He and keyboardist Mark Weitz wrote the music for the smash hit Incense and Peppermints, starting with a memorable riff dreamed up by Weitz. King contributed the bridge to then instrumental. Weitz tells the story. I couldn't figure out a bridge for the song. Ed King lived pretty close. I called him and told him I need a bridge for this new song idea I'm working on. He drove over, and about 45 minutes later, we had it. The single songwriter's credits uh, notoriously failed to note their role in creating the song. But Incense and Peppermints hit number one in 1967 and remains a rock pop radio staple to this day. Credit for Incense yeah, that and was Peppermints. My, that was my learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> I, was told, I was told by the, I guess the producers that this is what you have to do to get into the business. The yeah. You write to <laughs> well, Incense and Peppermints went to a songwriting team that worked with the pu- uh, publisher. He and White uh, collaborated again on Tomorrow, which charted at number 23 in early 1968. Once again, King came to the rescue with a bridge. King continued to write songs with White as well as guitarist Lee Freeman. Strawberry Alarm Clock songs that King co-wrote include Sit with the Guru, The Black Butter Trilogy, Pretty Song from Psych Out, and Song well, Wait a minute, I, 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 I did not, wait a minute, I did not write Sit with the Guru. I'm not taking credit for that. You're not, you're not <laughs> okay. taking credit for that one, huh? <laughs> no, no, no way. Well, somebody's wrong somewhere. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I do a really cool guitar solo in it, but I certainly didn't write it. No. Well, then King says the Strawberry Alarm co- uh, Clock tours with the Beach Boys in 67 and 68 outshine any other period in my life. Carl Wilson coming yeah. over to my room to show me the chords that God only knows far outweighs any Skinner experience. Uh, King wait, stayed- wait, 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 wait a minute. Where, where, when do I get to talk? Oh, well, I, I do an intro first, talk, <laughs> talking about you, oh. and then <laughs> we're doing an intro right now. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It, it, it's a bio, so everybody knows who you are, you know, all the young listeners. Okay. And everybody. okay. <laughs> all right. King stayed with the band until 1971 when he took a flyer and joined a southern rock band that had opened for the Strawberry Alarm Clock on a regional tour. Uh, that band was Leonard Skinner, which was heading into the studio to record its first album with producer Al Cooper. King started out playing bass and then switched to guitar. He formed a songwriting partnership with singer Ronnie Van Sant, which produced Poison Whiskey on that album, and then later Sweet Home Alabama, one of the band's two signature songs. Other Skinner songs co-written by King include Saturday Night Special, Swap Music, I Need You, Working for MCA, and Railroad Song. Uh, King's guitar playing and songwriting skills were an essential element to the band's first three albums, uh, pronounced Leonard Skinner, Second Helping, and Nothing Fancy. Uh, King decided to leave the band in 75 during the Torture Tour. Uh, He was replaced in 76 by Steve Gaines, who was killed in a plane crash, along with lead singer Ronnie Van Sant, backup singer Cassie Gaines, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, pilot Walter McCreary, and co-pilot William Gray. Other band members, Collins, Rosington, Wilkinson, uh, Powell, Powell, and Hawkins, Tour manager Ron Eckerman and several road crew suffered serious injuries. Uh, Ironically, Gaines and King shared the same birthday. 
1987, King joined the Leonard Skinner Survivors Reunion Tour and played with the band until he, his retirement from music in 1996. In 2006, King entered the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of Leonard Skinner. Now, it's my great pleasure. Where do I get this off? <laughs> it's my great pleasure to welcome Ed King, legendary guitar, Ooh. guitar songwriter for the Strawberry Alarm Clock, and Leonard Skinner to the Ray Shasho Show. Hello, well, Ed. We can talk now. It's been, nice. <laughs> it's been so nice talking to you, Ray. And uh, I just hope you have a nice day. So we're done now, huh? <laughs> So, 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 Ed, does this mean does this mean talking to me today means you're out of retirement? Oh, I'm no, 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 <laughs> not at all. I live a very serene life by the lake, and uh, right, I, I wouldn't come out of retirement for for enough for anything. <laughs> you know what? I don't blame you. <laughs> how are how are things in Nashville? I remember uh, Printer's Alley. Is that still there? Uh, it's still there. I think they're fixing to tear it down. Um, all of Nashville has changed. We moved out of Nashville nine months ago. Oh, you and it did? was the best move I ever made, yeah. Uh, we live out of the lake. It's about 45 minutes outside of town. Right. Yeah, I remember Pinter's Alley had a club by Boots Randolph. And we got, oh, you yeah. know, we met Boots. You know, he would come out and shake hands with everybody. It was, it was kind of cool. But it was kind of a, you know, a little bit of a shady atmosphere. They had, you know, like a... Um, a nude bar was also there at the time, and it was, it was just kind of a weird, you know, uh, yeah, weird, weird area there. But uh, it, was, it was different. But I loved I loved Nashville though. Mm-hmm. How's uh, how's uh, let's see how's Ollie doing? Oh, you keep up with my dogs, do you? Yeah, oh, they're I, they're doing great. They they went for a ride in the convertible today. Had to get the car inspected, and they're a couple of good boys. The, yeah, I love my buddies. I, I heard that Ollie got you through some, some tough times when you had the surgery and everything. Oh, he did, yeah. I yeah. probably couldn't have made it without him. He He's a great therapy dog and my constant friend, yeah. I, I, I'm a big animal lover as well. Uh, we That's good. Yeah, we take care of my, my daughter's got a Sheltie, and we've always mm-hmm. had Shelties and Collies and, you know, that, that kind of breed. But, yeah. Um, yeah. My, uh, my dog was our, our English Golden Doodles. Yeah, they're part golden. They're part golden retriever, part poodle. Oh, they're beautiful dogs. I saw, I saw them on YouTube. One one of the uh, yeah. interviews that you did. They're lovely. Now, are you still writing music at least when, when you're no. home? I, no, not really. I, I've written a couple couple things, but I really have had a hard time finding a writing partner. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, after writing with Ronnie Van Sant, uh, you get really spoiled. <laughs> Uh, what I would do with Ronnie was just I'd sit down, usually amongst the band, and Ronnie would point to anybody in the band and say, who's got an idea? Right. And then I'd throw an idea out there, and uh, if Ronnie liked it, he would usually sit in the corner on the couch with his head in his hands and coming up with lyrics. If he didn't, he'd just point to another guy and say, what do you got? Yeah. So uh, that's pretty much how we wrote, and the songs were written usually... Very quickly. I mean, it take a, take all day to put a song together, but Ronnie was very quick about com, coming up with his lyrics. He'd usually come up with a verse, maybe write a chorus or something. Then he'd go down to the dock and go fishing. <laughs> and we were we were about a oh maybe fifty yards from the from the dock. It really, the right. music really carried well down there, and that's where he wrote the rest of the lyrics. He'd never wrote anything down. He just uh, came up with it, and when he was ready, he'd come back up and start singing. What, was this at the Hell House? Yes. At, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was. It was a cabin. It was a cabin by McGirt's Creek. Right. And uh, there was a train trestle track right down the creek, and kids used to sit on it and listen to us play. Yeah. Yeah. The music would carry along the water, I guess. Oh yeah. 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 I, I, I've interviewed a lot of top forty legends over the years. Uh, Tommy James, mm-hmm. Mark Mark Lindsay, Flo and Eddie, Petula Clark. Uh, Barry Winslow, a member from the Royal Guardsmen, Tommy mm-hmm. Rowe. Uh, the list goes on and on. But one of the most distinctive top 40 hits from the 60s has to be Incense and Peppermints. Uh, it was a number one hit and spent 16 weeks on the Billboard charts in, in 67. Wow, I didn't know it was that long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it, it ended up, uh, I, I've got a uh, the end of the year Billboard uh, for not for that year, it, it's incredible, mm-hmm. and I want people to know what kind of songs were playing on on regular mainstream radio back then. 
number one back then was oh. to serve with love by Lulu. Then you had the box tops uh, by. Build me a buttercup. Build me a buttercup. I know that was on it. Yep. The box tops, of course, the letter. Uh, yeah. Bobby Gentry was number three, owed to Billy Joe. Uh, the, the monkeys were on number five. The doors were, Light My Fire was number six. You had wow. Frank Sinatra <laughs> on the list. And you guys were actually finished at number 23 for the whole year. And what, what was amazing oh. about all this, you know, you had the, the Rolling Stones were right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Ruby Tuesday was 24, and even the Beatles were behind you. Penny Lane. Right. That was, yeah, yeah, the Beatles were, uh, and All You Need Is Love was number 30. That shows oh, you how powerful the, the song was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you well, wrote it was, that. Uh, it was, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I said you, you did that intro, right, to get the uh, psychedelic guitar intro to, to that song? Yeah, I played, I played guitar on that. I mean, that, that, that's, yeah. that's a song that will live on forever in, in everyone's mind, you know? I mean, you think you know, so? I think so, yeah. Huh. Well, that'd be, that'd be nice. I know Sweet Home will live forever. <laughs> uh, oh, it will, but, you know... But, you know, people of the 60s, you know, they, they always remember those, those, you know, legendary top 40 songs back then. And yeah. I appreciate it even more because I was a top 40 DJ back in the 70s. So it was, uh, Where? you know, Where uh, in, you? in Annapolis, Annapolis, Maryland. It, oh. it's, a, um, it's a station that is owned now by Pat Sajak. <laughs> oh, how about that? Yeah. Now, tell me what happened with that song. How come you guys didn't get the credit? Well, I hate to really cast the blame on anybody. Uh, Mark Weiss and myself wrote the music. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our manager took it to a publishing company because uh, we didn't have any lyrics for it. When the lyrics came back, we found that they'd pretty much taken our melody, added lyrics, and removed our names from the composition. Mm -hmm. And we kind of asked, well, what's up with that? And they said, well, our manager told me this is what you have to do to break into the business. I mean, I was only 17. I, I didn't know any better. I just thought yeah. it was, that was it. Yeah. That's a shame. Do you think that was a result of, you know, those, uh, you know, kind of managers, management, and they had back then in the 60s They were just kind of a little bit shady? I mean, a lot of people got well, screwed I, back then. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it was shady, yeah. yeah. I mean, it wasn't honest. Anything yeah. that's not honest is shady. Yeah. But I've been dealt, you know, I've been dealt a lot of that stuff, and I can, I can smell it now a mile away. Right, right. The uh, that's okay though. I mean, that's okay because Sweet Home made up for it all. Oh yeah, <laughs> that was that was the gift from above, believe me. Yeah, Saturday Night Special too. Yeah. Um, oh well, yeah, I love that tune. Yeah. Me, me too. That, that's had that, special, that's my, that has special significance to me. Well, that's in my top five of all time. That's a great. Oh you know, really? Oh yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a cool song. It yeah, a when cool I came song. to rehearsal that day with a riff, Ronnie started writing it. Um, I was the first one to hear it uh, as I was playing with the band in Hell House, you know. Right, right. He came up to me and he cupped my ear with his hand and he sung mm -hmm. me the first verse. That's and, amazing uh, the way well, he just I, came up with lyrics. That's really amazing. It is amazing the way he just came up with lyrics that quick. And the Beatles were kind of yeah. like that, too. They, they wrote lyrics very, very quickly. Yeah. Well... Yeah, I mean, if, I guess if you've got it, you've got it. You know, I mean, Ronnie was a genius that way. Yeah. But then, but then we spent some time putting the tune together, and he always trusted us on the music arrangement. He never right. interfered with that. That was our baby, you know. <clears throat> yeah. You know, Strawberry Alarm Clock, though. You know, they were ahead of their time. I mean, let's let's look back. And it got a Vita, which was psychedelic, came out in '68. The Piper at the Gates of Dawn album with Sid Barrett and Floyd, '67. And the Rolling Stones, their uh, Satanic Majesty's Request was late, uh, released late '67, and then of course Sgt. Pepper's yeah. in '67. So you guys were right there, you know, inventing yeah. the psychedelic sound. I, how did you get that? Where did you get the psychedelic influence? How, how did that all happen? Oh, I, I don't know. Probably, I don't know. Probably just the uh, far feast of Oregon and a maestro fuzz tone on the guitar. I mean, <laughs> we were just. We were just playing around, you know. It's a, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, I, people put a tag on it. I don't really know. I'm not really sure what psychedelic music is, but 
Well, you did it. <laughs> well, they also labeled Country Joe and the Fish psychedelic, and I didn't consider that psychedelic. No, no, I, I agree was, with you. That was real, like that was like country rock, right. park garage band, you know. Yeah, I agree with you. Did, on did, that. You, hear, did you ever hear a band called a Music Machine? Oh yeah, sure. Well, they were those guys are ahead of their time, man. Yeah, those guys are great. Well, the Alarm Clock so, were a anyway. great band. They were a great band. Uh, you guys came up with. Uh, uh, incense of peppermints, wake up, it's tomorrow, the world in a uh, seashell, and good morning, starshine in 69. Those are the albums that, yeah. that happened, yeah. And uh, then I guess what, Jimmy Pittman took over on the lead guitar lead, right? And then you went to bass at one time? For a while, for a yeah. while, yeah. Yeah. T- talk about your... Could, not, uh, could not find Could not find a good bass player. Oh really? That would happen? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yeah. Now nowadays they're a dime a dozen. Back then, I know. you couldn't find one. Huh. What? Well, talk about your experience with the Beach Boys. You, you must have been friends with them. You guys toured, and then uh, yeah, we did. Yeah. We did two tours with them. Right. The second tour in '68. Our tour began on the day that Martin Luther King Jr. was killed in Memphis, and mm-hmm. we were supposed to play in Memphis that night. And really? uh, so the, that that show was called off, mm-hmm. and we spent the night in Nashville. Instead, we flew to Nashville. We all shared the same plane. It was us, the Beach Boys, and the Buffalo Springfield. Oh wow! So we flew to flew to Nashville, and we got these rooms at the Holiday Inn. Uh-huh. And some guy was going door to door selling handguns out of a flight case. You're kidding! And many of us bought one. No, I bought one. I was just turned 18, and I bought one. Huh. And went on stage with it, tucked down our pants. We didn't know what to expect. Here we were right. in the South, you know, and yeah. it was a interesting time. But, no, the Beach Boys were fine to us. The Buffalo Springfield, we had a great time with them. Uh, that was that was the highlight of my life, even to this day. Hmm. Oh, wait yeah. a minute. No, I have to say when James Burton visited me at my house a month ago, that was the highlight. A month ago? Oh, wow. Yeah. He just called up and said, hey, can I come over for a visit? I said, why, sure. <laughs> He's my, I mean, I, w- I would not be a guitar player today if it wasn't for James Burton. You still get? You still have a lot of friends that uh, that visit you from time to time or, or give you a ring no, on the phone? I, I, I don't allow many visitors. Really? Yeah. I'm, 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 pretty much a, I'm pretty much a recluse. Yeah. You know, walls, gates, alarms, <laughs> you know. You got a moat? <laughs> Oh, cliff! Yeah, I live on a on a, a cliff. My house is surrounded by a four story cliff. Oh, really? That must be nice. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. No visitors. Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm friends with uh, you know Joe Bonsell from uh, the Oak Ridge Boys, and uh, he lives okay. out in Nashville. He lives close to Nashville, probably like you do, like mm-hmm. 20 minutes out or something like that. Uh, I think he lives in Hendersonville, somewhere around Hendersonville. Oh, that's real close. That's yeah. real close to where I live. Yeah. Yeah, nice guy. Did, did you ever get a chance to meet uh, the Beatles or, or Hendrix? Well, yeah, I met Hendrix. Um, yeah, that was quite an experience. Um, the, the guys in the band met John Lennon. Uh, he right. popped in on the studio. I wasn't there that day, but mm-hmm. I've, I'd never met any of them. Well, was, uh, yeah, I met a lot of guys that talked to a lot of guys that knew Hendrix. And he said uh-huh. such a nice, such a nice laid-back guy. You know that all he cared about was his guitar, and he carried his guitar. Well, around. I never got, I never got a chance to to talk to him. I was actually sitting in a corner, right. watching him change guitar strings and eating a case of Snickers bars. A case of Snickers bars. <laughs> about, about three quarters of a case, not the whole case. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Now, Mark, Mark is still in the in the Strawberry Alarm Clock, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, and they're, and they're still do, doing a tour, and every once in a while, I, I checked out their schedule, and they're not real active, but they, every once in a while they'll do a tour. All right, Ed, uh, have you uh, you still keep in contact with Mark at all? Or I know he's a good friend of yours. I talk to Mark regularly. Yeah, probably oh, good. two, three times a week. Awesome. Yeah. How's he doing? He's doing uh, still happy with the the band, I guess, huh? He had a little accident out in L.A. where somebody tried to run him over. Oh my god! It was gosh. an accident, but yeah, and he's kind of banged up, so uh, yeah, he hasn't hasn't been playing with a band this week. It's gonna take yeah. him a couple months, I think, before he gets his self right again. Oh my goodness! Crazy things happening nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. You live in a yeah. strange world, man. I was fortunate. I know, but... Yeah, 
I was fortunate to meet and hang with Leonard Skinner, and it was actually June of 75. Um, I was oh. working at Capitol Center Arena in Maryland. Uh, me and three other guys were sat and watched the band rehearse Saturday Night Special. What a treat that was. I, 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 Ronnie wasn't singing during the rehearsal. I think you guys were just doing uh, uh, the, in, you know, the uh, instrumental. But I, or it could have well, been part that, of a that must have been That must have been right after I left the band. In 75? I, I left the band on May 26, 1975. Oh, yeah. really? Huh. I just walked out. Yeah, I had enough. It was a, uh, let's see, it was uh, Leonard Skinner, Elvin Bishop, and Marshall Tucker. Do you remember that, or was that oh. when you left? Well, well, we yeah. played with Marshall Tucker a lot. Right. And Skinner um, opened yeah. um, in 73 for The Who. Now, you were probably at that show. I was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did the whole Who tour. That was nice. That was a real hoot. <laughs> that had to be exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we almost got thrown off the plane in Montreal because I think the, the stewardess offered to uh, ask Keith Moon if he wanted uh, any uh, coffee or cola, and he looked at her and said Cuba, and it <laughs> took us all off the plane. Yeah. They thought he was hijacking, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a serious offense. Yes, it is. But uh, that wasn't wasn't very funny. <laughs> Did, did you did you get a chance to uh, compare notes with uh, Pete Towson? I did. Yeah. You did. Yeah. Yeah. What what a great tour that one must have been, huh? Yeah, it was it was very interesting, and unlike uh, some bands that open for the Who that get booed off the stage, we did not. So that was good. No, I remember when you guys uh, opened up in in D.C. in Maryland for that show, and the reviews were unbelievable for Skinner. I mean, I, yeah. I think you guys, a lot of people said you blew the who off the stage in Maryland. And that's mm -hmm. that's well. exactly why, you know, I, I probably got, the way you guys got so big after the who tour, because of the, all the great reviews and everything. That had a lot to do with it, yeah. 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 Saturday Night Special, Night Special. I mean, what a song, man. And, you know, uh How'd you come up with that riff? I know it was was it you and, and Gary that were working working the song together. No, that was just me. Was I just mean, you. I'm always I'm always coming up with ideas for songs, and I would just right. uh, I'd show up and he'd ask me, well, "What have you got?" And you know, it was uh, just one of those things that he just kind of fell into. Like I said, he started singing me the first verse probably about 20 minutes into us rehearsing it. And then, you know, we just, you pretty much finish writing a song in about an hour, but it takes about four hours to put it together. Right. And that actually, that song we put together twice. Cause, really? Because uh, the first version, yeah, well, the first version we did with Bob Burns mm -hmm. uh, wasn't quite the way I had heard it. And uh, so we dropped the tune from the set for a few months. And then um, when Bob kind of was having problems, we auditioned Artemis Pyle. Just uh, myself, Leon Wilkerson, and Artemis mm -hmm. were, were working up this tune, and Al Cooper stopped by where we were playing and heard it and said, look, why don't we go in the studio and just record it, three piece. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Then the other guys drove up and put their parts on top of it. The, the, the song but, is featured on so many different you know, like soundtracks. The 78, the Blue yeah. Collar, starring Richard Pryor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, Season two episode of the American uh, Supernatural was on Supernatural. Of course, it was oh, okay. on. Yeah, it was on the Longest Yard twice. It was also on the remake. Yeah, twice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know that. No, it's a pretty much a timeless tune. It yeah. it doesn't sound very dated at all. It, it's. You no, know, that's. I think. I think one reason we don't sound dated is because we don't use. We don't use many effects in the studio. Exactly. I mean, don't use any fuzz tones or right. or guitar processing. We just right. plug straight into the amp. Now on that amp, on that tune, I just bought an Echoplex unit, and so I recorded it on tape that way with the echo. And mm -hmm. that's really a no-no. You're not not really allowed to do that. Just, the producer always likes to add that afterwards. But I said, no, I'm, I really don't trust you with the timing on it. I'm gonna add it now. And so that was the only effect I ever used. Huh. Uh, but mainly we just plugged into the amps, no fuzz tones or overdrive pedals, and, and that's the reason the guitars sound so fresh today is because they're not processed. Yeah. 
That's why Skinner was so good live too. I mean, you know, whatever you heard yeah. in the studio was pretty much what you heard live. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great live band, fantastic. I, I saw Skinner several times back in the day. You know. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. You you know you were so important to Skinner. Uh, you know, after you came aboard, you kind of felt alienated, right? And I think there was there's a picture of you. With the band on one side, and you were all standing all by yourself on one, on the other side, was that just because yeah. like in the in the beginning you were from California and they were from Jacksonville, you know, and they were Southern that, boys? That photo, that photo is totally subconscious, <laughs> but it represents it. Is, but it represents a lot. Yeah, it does. It's like I, I stood there for a reason of which I did not know at the time, but that says everything. Um, Ronnie is the one that wanted me in the band. The other guys didn't really. I, actually, Billy and Leon were okay, but Gary and Alan, I was really. Uh, they didn't really want me around, so they were glad when I left. But uh, I got along well with Billy and Leon. Actually, mm-hmm. I got along with the other everybody great, except uh, except for that one factor that they didn't want me there. But other than that, <laughs> I mean, you fit in. You you fit in perfectly with the band. I mean, you know, you even had to look, you know, after a while. And so what what was it like working with Al Cooper? I've interviewed him uh, about a year and a half ago. It seems like a nice guy. What was it like in the studio yeah. with him? Well, uh, the rest of the band couldn't get along with him because uh, he was from New York. Right. Um, and although they did recognize the huge opportunity that was, was handed them because Al really believed in the band. Um, and... During the first album, there was some struggles, some pushing back and forth. Actually, the first mix came back with, oh, there were some things added that Al thought would enhance it, and the band didn't like it. Um, so he went back and remixed it the way the band wanted it, right. which was, you know, which was a good thing. Um, I always got along well with Al. And uh, so, I mean, I every once in a while, he'd come to Nashville from New York, and we'd get together. Mm-hmm. No, I haven't seen him in years, though. He's got a uh, he's got an excellent column. I don't know if you read it or not. Uh, it's called "New Music for Old People." It's on the Morton Report. And yeah, I've read some of it. Yeah, it's, it's I read some good. of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, yeah, he. Well, he has a good ear for new music for old people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's an old. I mean, uh, us old timers, a lot of us don't understand what's going on today. Yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, especially on mainstream radio, you know, it's it's a lot of uh, yeah. dance type music, you know, and club type. It's, music. What kind of what kind of music? Uh, you know, like club type music, or it, to me, oh. I, I call it like a derivative of disco. You know, what's on mainstream radio oh, nowadays? Oh, yeah, it, it, yeah, yeah. You know, I miss the days of you know uh, hearing the Strawberry Alarm Clock or Skinner on the radio. You know. So I'm hoping maybe it'll come back one day. I, I don't know. I don't know if rock and roll is ever going to come back. Certainly not the way it, it was at one time. I think well, it's. I think it's all gone. Gone forever, huh? In other words, I I, I really think that you know uh, things progress and time goes on, and some trends come back, but they never come back like they were. Just like the all these girls wearing these psychedelic outfits. Well. That's fine and nice, but the the mindset is certainly isn't what was there in the '60s, you know. Yeah. But they can try and bring it back. The thing is, there's not many bands that really just sound natural anymore. They just sound, like I said before, processed, overproduced, yeah. and yeah. yeah, you're overproduced. But I mean, um, at least we always have those that music to look back to, and a lot of kids listen to it and they love it, and they should. Yeah. I don't think they sell like you know. There's not a lot of bands that sell the way they used to back in the day. You know, and there's, there's maybe a handful of popular. Like what? What do you mean? Nowadays. Well, there's like a handful of popular artists. You know, you, you have your Taylor Swifts and uh, Ariana Grande. Oh and, yeah, you know. oh yeah. Back in the back in the day, whenever a new band came out, everybody was oh I got to hear this, you know. And but yeah. the thing is, the market's too saturated now, and it's really just a lot of mediocre stuff out there nobody really stands out well once in a while somebody does uh, and that's it it's just oversaturation yeah i mean those right. face it back in the back in the day we were pioneers still in 1974 even though rock and roll was 
20 years old, we were still kind of pioneers because we were still inventing it. Exactly. What is the hope for the future of music? What do you think? Do you think anything is going to change? Or I mean, we can't go on well, like this forever. Right? <laughs> well, with the laws the way they are, they seem to be very uh, anti-creativity. They're certainly anti-songwriter. And right. I, feel, I feel badly for songwriters these days because it's just uh, the world has changed. And mm-hmm. I mean, it's changed for album sales. People are illegally downloading stuff and... Yeah, it makes it makes it really difficult for uh, an artist to make a living. Even the proficient uh, guitarist, you don't have those great musicians anymore. Like you know, I mean, every band had a great guitar player, and you, uh, yeah. where are they yeah. today? You know, I can't even name well, one guy that really. Stands you don't. Out. You don't really hear the um, the cool wrist like you heard before. Right. Just a, just a lot of chords. Uh, I don't know where uh, guitar players today are learning from, but they might be learning from the 80s and not before that. I mean, they should. I mean, my roots are in the 50s, you know, <laughs> and so I learned. I learned all this really cool stuff on the guitar. I yeah. still listen to 50s and 60s music on right. my jukebox because there's not. Not that it's. That might sound old fashioned to some, but there's some really good root stuff in there that everybody should know. There's yeah. things to play and are things in arrangements and uh, just really cool stuff that a lot of people who just listen to the surface, they don't really hear what's going on down inside. You, you know, I, I've, got a, I've got a jukebox too, and I handpicked all the 45s. Most of them are from the 60s. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's, just a, it's just a clean sound. You know, they, they, I they think weren't, it's great, yeah. Yeah, they, they didn't have any... It's of natural. Them. Yeah, it's very natural. It's natural. And a lot of those sounds, all they did was have a, a a mic for the vocalist and for the band, maybe two mics that were overhanging in the room, right. you know. And, I mean, I, I tell you, I just got a greatest hits of the coasters. Oh, Man, those, wow. were, those songs are incredible. Yeah. The arrangements and the musicianship is so simple. But yeah. the thing is, it's very well played and uh, extra, uh, the ideas are extraordinary like you have one song where a bass is playing very simply but there's a guitar behind it playing what today would be a bass line exactly it's just i mean it's just it's so well orchestrated and you remember the you know like the wrecking crew the guys that would come into the studio yeah 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 Yeah, and the muscle shoals swampers in alabama yeah those are those were our heroes yep Uh, and uh, that's what we learned from what about the Ventures? You know, that was such a clean sound, you know, yeah, and uh, yeah. those guys were amazing. They were really amazing. I love that old stuff. I, Like I said, I listen to it every week. Yeah, me too. You, you know, I, good, I, yeah. at, at my at, at my house, I, I, have, I have an indoor pool. I'm lucky to have this thing. Right. But I'm out there every day for an hour, and I program my jukebox, and I listen to these old songs every day. Yep. <laughs> you know, 60s, 70s. Only like three things from the 80s, nothing from the 90s, uh, actually nothing from henceforth, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know where I'm at. I'm an old-timer. I'm 67 for crying out loud. Ah, you're still young. Come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, young at, I'm, I'm young at heart, but the bones are disagreeing. You, you know, I, I, I interviewed uh, Petula Clark. She's in her 80s, and she still has yeah. new albums coming out. She's got. She's still working. I interviewed Engelbert Humperdinck. He's still got albums coming out. He's in his 80s. And uh, yeah. you know John May, you know John Mayall, right? Yeah. yeah. John, uh, I actually covered his uh, 80th birthday, was here in Sarasota. And, mm-hmm. man, he, he still sets up his own equipment. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's... Yes. Well, if he, was... if he was a drummer, he'd be in trouble. He'd be in big trouble, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know the riff, the, the riff goes a long way, the famous riff, because that goes on forever. It does. I mean, how, you know how it many does. Days and, and you can and you can talk all day about how great guitar players are, and there right. are some great ones, you know. Right. But the thing is, what separates them is the guy with the riff that sticks in your brain. Exactly. You know. How many I, I did a gig. Are... I, what's uh, that? 
I, I was going to say how many people play smoke on the water to learn how to play guitar. Oh, yeah. What a great, <laughs> great riff, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was playing with the Outlaws this past weekend and did a really? couple of their songs. Yeah, we did a couple of their songs, and then uh, I broke into Sweet Home Alabama, and the place went just nuts, you know? It's just crazy. Of course, very, kind of- very seldom do... Very seldom do people get to hear it just like the record. Yeah. Um, and I really, I really kind of like the only one that can really play it right. So, so I yeah, they go right. nuts. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, it's a, it's an amazing song, and you know, it, it, you know, it does. It sounds very southern. And here's a guy from California coming up with a riff like that. Well, I learned from a lot of Southern players, man. Really? I learned from a lot of Southern players. Well, some of my favorite records of the 50s were Southern people. Right. I didn't live in the South, but I soaked up that that feel. And so when I got the opportunity to move out of L.A. and move to the South, mm-hmm. well, I tell you what really, what really brought that on was I we did a, a tour of the South in 1970, the alarm clock did, and... Um, not a big tour. We actually did colleges and we rented a car and we actually drove for three months through the South. It was a tour of the South. Mm -hmm. And I got to know the South like I never did. I got to eat up my first meet and three. You know, you guys out in California don't know what that is, but we do. It's called a meet and three. And I was hooked. And so the first, when I went back out of that tour, got home to California uh, a couple months later, I went to the Santa Monica Civic and saw the Allman Brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that was October 9th, 1971. And after that show, I said, "Well, I don't think I want to live here anymore." So I packed up and I moved on here. Yeah. We we have uh, Dickie Betts lives about I don't know 15 20 minutes from me here. Yeah. And uh, he does a lot of charity work, and I've covered a lot of his shows. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, he, he's a local around here. But sweet Alabama. Yeah, was, I think I think he was kind of upset when CMT did the best Southern rock songs of all time, and Ramblin' Man came in at number two. I don't think he liked that. He didn't like that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so Sweet Home Alabama was kind of um, kind of coming going back at Neil Young, right, from Southern Man in Alabama, from from those two songs, pretty much. Is yeah. that where that, the lyrics came from, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. I, I when I saw the uh when I saw Skinner, I think it was in you know, seventy five, I remember Ronnie uh, you know, singing the lyrics, uh, Southern Man, you know, they don't need him around any anyhow, but he, he got the mm-hmm. mic stand and right at that moment he throws the mic stand down real hard and then the crowd goes wild, of course. <laughs> yeah. It was a pretty cool moment. Yeah. Yeah. How long did it take you to come up with Sweet Home Alabama? I mean, it wasn't just the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, you what? Know, that riff, but it was also the, the, uh, the lead part that you did as well. And that, well, that, well, the riff came up. I mean, the riff was very simple. Gary right. was playing something else on the guitar, and I just got there. He was there before me. And as soon as I heard what he was playing, I picked up my Stratocaster and I bounced my riff off of his. Right. And right. Ronnie said, Ronnie just said, keep that going. And he ended up writing the first verse and the second verse. And then I think we wrote the chorus and then Ronnie went fishing. But that song was real quick. I mean, that thing was written in 20 minutes. That's amazing. That really but it took four hours. Like I said, it took four hours yeah. to assemble it and arrange it. And that night, we didn't have. We knew where a guitar solo was going to go, and I knew I wanted it, but I didn't know what to play. And yeah. so that night, we went home, and I dreamt both solos in a dream. No, really? No. Yeah, and I always sleep with a guitar next to the bed. So I woke up, I played it exactly as I saw it in my head, mm-hmm. and I went out to rehearsal and played it. And uh, I guess the guys liked it, but we kept it. Yeah, I know. I know Al Cooper in the studio. Once he heard it, he didn't like it. Really? And he wanted to change. Well, he wanted to change it because he said I played the solo in the wrong key. Hmm. See the song. The song it starts on a D chord, but it resolves in G. It's it's what I call a reverse G progression. Right. And and Al played my solo for people like Mike Bloomfield and other people, and 
and they all agreed with him that I played it in the wrong key. But the band stood up for me and refused to let him change it. Do you want to know why? Why? Because, because I'd seen the solo in a dream. Hmm. It's it's the Southern mysticism thing that uh-huh. will never leave the South. That's the reason I like it. And they wouldn't change it because, hey, man, it, he saw it in a dream. That's right. Yeah. It's an omen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it must have been great working with Ronnie. Uh, it sounds like you guys were uh, really hit it off well, especially, the, you know, he wanted you in the band, and the other guys were kind of kind of reluctant. So he, he yeah, saw... Yeah, very, very much so. Me, well, I think, I think they were okay. I think they were okay with me playing bass. Right. But then after the first album was done, Ronnie told me I was really the worst bass player he'd ever played with. So, <laughs> yeah. So I thought I was out of a job. He goes, no, no, we're going to get our old bass player back. We're going to put you over on guitar. So the first day of rehearsal with me on guitar, the first song was Sweet Home that we wrote. That was a pretty good sign. Is it true that uh, Give Me Back My Bullets, the fans actually threw bullets at the stage and you had to pull that song out, out of your song list? No, that... The bullets being thrown on stage came after the song. Came after the song, okay. Yeah. Um, Ronnie, the, originally Ronnie sang, put the song together. The bullets meant a chart position on your exactly. records. Exactly, right. And right. we weren't, we put out, I think we put out Saturday Night Special as a single and it flopped. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Ronnie was, just wrote a song called, I want my bullets back. You want to be number 10 with a bullet, five with right. a bullet. Right, you know, right. bullet on a chart meant you're going straight up, you know. Exactly. And that's what the song was about, was your chart position. People thought it was real bullets, so they, when the song came out, they started throwing bullets <laughs> at the band. That's true. Yeah, and you had to take it off the uh, off the playlist, right, because of that? Well, I don't know, because I'd left the band by then. Right, you left the band already. Well, I was with the band when they. I was with the band when they started to write it, but I was right. not in the band when they finally recorded it. Yeah. What were your thoughts after the plane crash? I mean, that that had to have been horrific, especially you know just knowing that you left the band and what could have been and all that, huh? That, that was well, I uh, I always knew it was going to end badly. That's why I left. Really? I was doing poorly. Yeah, I was doing poorly. I was I was in drugs too bad, and the band was just they were everybody was just drinking so much. I'm not I'm not really a drinker. You know, right. I'll do. I, I used to do my own thing with drugs, but yep. I just uh, I'm not a drinker. And they were just into like beating everybody up and all this stuff. And finally, I just said, I've had it. I knew it wasn't going to end well, but I never could have envisioned that. I mean, mm-hmm. but I wasn't surprised. Well, I mean, I was surprised that how it ended, but I wasn't surprised that it ended. You know, it was very sad, man. Just really very, sad. Very sad. You know, all, all, I yeah. mean, all the events that had happened to Skinner were very, very sad, you know, even after the crash, you know. You know, you know I heard that the uh, it was actually pilot error because the uh, he, was, he was out of gas and he, and he turned on the second tank, and it actually didn't go, and it, it, it went, he emptied the tank by accident. It's yeah, fire. that's what I heard. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I never, I never read the, the report. I just figured, yeah. you know. Let it be, you know. Is what yeah. it is. And Artemis Pyle was kind of a, kind of a hero, saving. Some I people. think he was. Yeah. I think he was. Gary has said on TV shows and stuff that Artemis just ran to save his life. Hey, I, I know Artemis, and Artemis isn't like that. Yeah. Artemis ran to get help, and I'll believe that right. always. Yeah. Yeah, he had. They said he had a, like a rib sticking out of his, uh, you know, coming out. And bleeding mm. all over the place, and he still got to a house, you know, to try yeah. to get help. That, that's an amazing. That, that's a book right there. <laughs> that's a heck of yeah, a story. Yeah, well, I think he's trying to make a movie of it right now. Oh, is he really? Well, uh, yeah, that's what I heard. I don't know how much cooperation he's going to get, but he's got somebody interested. Just wants to do the few days, the few days late leading up to the plane crash, and right, then right after. Yeah. 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 Did, did you attend uh, Ronnie's funeral? I did. You did. Yeah. What What was that? Yeah. What, what was that like? No, oh, it was monumentally sad. Yeah. People were actually falling down in tears. Really. Literally. Mm-hmm. It, they uh, somebody uh, I think 
disturbed his gravesite after a while, right? And they had a they had to move it. I, I think they moved the site because of I, I could have been fans. Who knows? I, I think they did yeah. The I I so, I know that it was moved. I don't know too much about the details, but. Yeah. I do know they moved it because I went out and visited at one time. Yeah, and, and Ronnie kind of, I think he told his dad that he kind of foresaw himself dying and not... Ronnie Ronnie told me many times, and I got told him I get getting tired of hearing it. Yeah. He said, I'm not going to live to be 30. Many times. I just, man, I just don't want to hear this, you know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, even Hendrick said the same thing, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So it must have meant a lot to you. What, what, what do you think about uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and entering that? I, I saw the I saw the footage of you. It was really, mm-hmm. really good, by the way. You, you did great. I mean, your your uh, performance that night was fantastic, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I enjoyed sorry. that very much. It, it uh, I was glad it finally happened. It took eight years. That was an awesome night, and I guess Kid Rock joined you guys on stage. Yeah, during the show, it was really kind of a mess. Uh, Kid right. Rock, Kid Rock at, at Sat would be the night before um, at this uh, nightclub in New York, and he was just taking notes. He and I were talking. He was jotting down all these notes, mm-hmm. and then the night of the Hall of Fame, the next night, he gets up there and he starts reading from these notes, and it's really disjointed. But what he got was very good. Right. But then the guy in the editing room put it all together, and it turned out spectacular. Right. That's yeah, where it, it all made sense is in the editing room. Great performance, though. You, you know, you yeah. really shined during that. Yeah, thank you. I was I was yeah. happy with it. Well, Ed, you're a great guitar player, man, and you know, great songwriter. I mean, it's, it's like I say, I was yeah. a pretty decent gunslinger in my day. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Yeah. Ed, here's a question I ask everybody that I interview. Uh, if you had yeah. a Field of Dreams wish, you know, like the movie Field of Dreams, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, uh, who would that be? Ronnie. It would be Ronnie, yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah he was the best there is. There isn't anybody. Yeah. I think he was one of the most original American talents that has been in years. I, mean, I think you're right, and probably a little underrated, too, right? Oh, very well... Extremely underrated. Yeah. I mean, I saw a list of all these dead rock stars that died before they were 30, and this picture isn't among them. And uh, I don't think people really... The only songs they really know are Freebird and Sweet Home Alabama. Many people have never dug into the catalog to hear things like uh, Things Going On or uh, right, I'm a Country Boy. Railroad Song is really a cool song because yeah. that is really... Ronnie's singing from the heart on that tune. Yeah. People people always ask me, what was Ronnie like? And I tell them, pretty easy. Just pick out any six songs that he wrote, and that's him. Yep. And that was, that was the cool thing about working with him. You knew you were going to get something from his soul, not just some made-up, you know, thing he saw right. on TV or something, you know? It's actually part of his soul. Yeah, pretty t- special Tuesday, stuff. Tuesday's Gone. No, yeah, not one of my favorite tunes. Really? Yeah. Well, it's just too, it's so long. Yeah, yeah. I mean, who who likes a an eight an over eight minute ballad? You know what else is eight? <laughs> you know what else is eight minutes long? Well, won't get fooled again by the Who. Tell me what what is the be- better use of eight minutes? Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah it's a nice song, but yeah. it's not worth eight minutes. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, people always uh, go to that song when they, they think of uh, Ronnie for some reason. I guess kind of. A I don't. Yeah, I know they do, and I know many people love it, and that's fine. Yeah. Well, I think Curtis Blow is a great song. Saturday Night Special is definitely I, my favorite of all time for Skinner. I was, song. I was going to say I think Kurt, the Ballad of Curtis Blow is one of my favorites. Is it? Yeah. Because well, that's that's Ronnie singing from the heart. Right. So what's next for Keep, for Ed? Uh, uh, what are you going to do now? Nothing. I know you're retired. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> nothing. If it's nice in the morning, I'll go out on my boat. Um, you know, I just uh, I I never know what I'm going to do until the sun comes up. Yeah. But, uh, I'm just uh, I'm enjoying not I'm enjoying not having to be anywhere at any special yeah. time. You have children, grandkids. I have uh, children and grandkids. 
Anybody in the music? No. No, nobody in the music. Yeah. No. Yeah. Did they all know your past, and uh, yeah, did they ever pick up a Skinner record or the alarm clock? Mm, and, uh, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. We never really, never really discuss it with them. Really. Yeah. Huh. You must like Chet Atkins if you like. Uh, you like well, the country sure. pickers? Oh yeah, I figured that. Uh, yeah, Chet, Chet and Jerry yeah. Reed, sure. Yeah. I can't yeah. play like those guys, but I have watched them, and yeah, pick up the little things that I could use, you know. Yeah, I, I'm friends with I, uh, Marty Robin, Marty Robbins' daughter, Janet, and. Uh, oh yeah, I love Marty Robbins. Oh man. Yeah. I he, grew he up never on talked. That stuff. Too, he never talked too much about you know the business and everything when he got home with, with the kids. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, same same kind of thing, I think. Well, I talked to James Burton when he visited. His wife told me, you know, James never plays at home. <laughs> Which... <laughs> That's amazing. I found that kind of strange. Now you play. You play at home. I, I, I know play, that. I play. I play every day. Yeah. You got to. Yeah. 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 I, I've seen pictures of your gu- guitars hanging up and all that stuff. And have you been mm-hmm. buying any uh, guitars lately? Have you, have you gotten any? any I think I'm done know? with that. I think I'm Are done you? with that. Yeah. yeah. What, what's your There's most prized possession? My most I mean, prized possession. Yeah, Probably like my nineteen my nineteen fifty seven uh, black Stratocaster that is just beat to death. Oh wow, nice. Yeah. Very nice. It's totally beat. Totally beat, huh? Yeah. Plays itself pretty much. Yeah. I I had a uh, seventy three Fender Telecaster that I sold. Uh, Mm-hmm. Had lots of autographs on it. Johnny Winter and uh, John K. Oh, really? Yeah. What did you sell it for? Money? Uh, yeah, I, I sold it for about thirty-eight hundred dollars because wow, it went, okay. Went, it, went, it went towards a book. You know, I'm, I'm an author also. I've written a couple of books. Yeah. And, uh, it went towards editing costs and things like that. I to, to, to I this day, it. I kind of I miss I miss the guitar a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. It's been with me everywhere. I've, I mean, I I have one that I'm going to sell one day. And yeah. it's worth it's worth a lot of money, and I'll just oh, dig sure. it out of the vault and sell it. And I'll be sad I sold it, but I hardly play it anymore. I'm yeah, very much of a Stratocaster guy, really. Right. I just you still have the those. guitar that you uh, that you wrote, uh, "Sweet Home Alabama," and uh, and some of the scary that guitars. Classics. That guitar's in the Hall of Fame. Oh, it's in the Hall of Fame, really. It's on display there. Yeah, if it's still on display. I don't know if it's on display or not, but they have it. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Ed, anything else? Anything you like to promote, causes? Anything no. else you like to add? No? No, I'm good, man. Everything's all good. I'm I'm as yeah. content as content gets. Awesome. That, that's great to hear. Yeah. We're very happy for you. Uh, take care thank of those uh, dogs and the, and the kids and grandkids and you know, we, we. I thank you so much for accepting my invitation to the show. I I know you're a private guy, and you went out of your way to do this. So we really appreciate it. Trust me when I say this. I don't do many interviews. Right. So that's, that's why. That's fact, why I, I really appreciate it. I turned it. down. I turned down three last week. So for some reason, you got in. <laughs> oh, we're, we're Facebook friends. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's what that's, it is. That means a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But nice, nice talking to you, Ray. Good talking to you too, Ed. Okay, keep in touch once in a while. I will. Take care of yourself. Right. You too. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye now. You can visit Ed King on uh, Facebook at www.facebook.com slash ed ed dot king dot five two six eight seven. Very special thanks to Doug and Don Newsom with BBS Radio for making it all happen every show. Coming up next show, Rick Roberts, former lead singer, songwriter, and guitarist for Firefall and author of several best-selling books. Join me bi-weekly Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on the Ray Shasho Show. If you have comments or suggestions or would like to be a guest on the Ray Shasho Show, call 941-877-1552 or email us at raypublicityworksagency.com. And don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's. The True Story of an Eclectic American Family and Their Wacky Family Business, or the second edition entitled Wacky Shenanigans on F Street, Proud to be Politically Incorrect in Washington, D.C., available now at Amazon.com. And I promise you, you will live it. 
Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com, specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Join Ray Shasho every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on... PBS Radio, Station 1.